I have an important declaration for us as we begin this important topic. Marriage is really hard. Now, maybe you think that's a negative statement. I, I could also say marriage is wonderful. I could say it's God-designed. I could even say for many people it's miserable. And, and maybe you would relate to all of those things. But I think universally we can say marriage is hard work. And somehow this, this COVID-19 and the tension that's in every part of our culture and also just the hardship of, of working differently and being at home together, it's, it's just made it really hard. I, I was reading some, uh, some Twitter feeds and it was like, man, even his chewing bothers me. And there's just this sense of rising frustration. Uh, one of them, the fairly famous blogger said, you know, I started off this morning, I said to my husband, what are your plans for the day? And he said, none of your business. <laughs> and she said, I guess things are going fine. So marriage is a crucible in which God wants to change us. And I have been married 38 years now. And what I hear is that the first 50 years are the hardest. So I still have a little ways to go. And I am, I started this morning with an apology for hurting my wife. So I am not trying to speak to you as an expert. We're trying to go together to the scriptures and say, Man, we fail at this, and this is difficult, but it is so, so important. So I want to walk us through how it is that in the middle of our relationship with Christ, we learn how in the ups and downs and the stresses and the difficulties of marriage, how those of us who were married can really learn to come closer to Christ and to honor him more in the way that we operate in our marriage. And for those of you who are single, I want to encourage you to really engage uh, because I think if you're a teenager and you're looking forward to marriage, man, you need to learn everything you can because there are very few good courses and all we tend to operate on is our examples and half of them are bad. And maybe you are single and looking to get married. And let me tell you, it's something that you need to be praying about and trusting God to work in you because it's a lot more about being the right person than it is just about finding the right person. And maybe you are somebody who's been through a divorce or you have been through many rough relationships and maybe God can begin to help you see how those relationships could have been different or maybe how your future relationships can be different. So we are going to be talking about Ephesians chapter 5. If you haven't turned there already and Ephesians talks about the first part of the book about how God has poured his love and his grace and how he's forgiven us and then chapters 4, 5, and 6 talk about how do we imitate Christ? How do we walk in light and in love? How do, how do we have the same kinds of attitudes that are honoring to God? And, and we want to bring that down to the statement that we hinged off of last week, which he said, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I know that submission seems like it's a dirty word. Uh, submission to church authorities sometimes is difficult. Submission to the government. And, and let me tell you, there were some very wonderful responses to that message. I know it was controversial. I know for some of you it was difficult. And, and the best response that I, I appreciated was somebody said, you know, I listened carefully and I realized I had gotten involved in some rebellious attitudes in my heart. And, and I think that's the honest truth probably for all of us. And now we're going to take it in a deeper, more personal level. He says, I want you to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That, that relates to all the other spheres, but it also now begins to be very, very intimate as we talk about how does that look in marriage. And so in Ephesians 5, he, he gives us this kind of conclusion and it. He makes it a really big deal. He said, this is a profound mystery but I'm talking about Christ and the church. That marriage is more than just a, a good sociological arrangement. He says, I design marriage and I, I have the husband and the wife and you are representing the, the love relationship between Jesus Christ and the church. And we are to be seeing marriage as sacred. We're to see marriage as something extremely valuable. And we are, I think, also called on to say that marriage is the way, one of the ways that God's pointing out his love and his light to the watching world. That the marriages where Christ is in the middle should be different. That they should be categorically different. And we live in a world of deep brokenness and so many marriages are failing and so many marriages are miserable. And, and, and it's often 
honestly a, a mutual manipulation to get what I want rather than a deep, loving, caring relationship. And so we want to come to the scriptures and say, what can we learn about this? How can we grow? How can we, how can we do what God has called us to do? And I want to ask you to do something very important. I want to ask you to listen for yourself. It is so easy to hear that and to think, I hope my husband gets this, I hope my wife gets this, or even maybe, I hope the kids are listening, or boy, my parents should have known this. Um, Even if you want to send this video to somebody else later, for right now, would you just say, God, what do I need to see about whatever my situation in life is? What do I need to hear of what you are speaking to me? And if I were to ask you, underneath all of this, what is the main marriage problem? What, what's the critical issue that causes all the difficulties? Why is it so hard? And the t- probably number one answer that would come up is communication. Man, communication is so difficult. And even when I think I'm communicating well, I'm not. And, and for others, you might say, well, finances, man, that's the spark that sets us off. And, and for other people, it, it has to do with conflict resolution or all of the things that you experience in your life that are different. And for some of it's, it's just a, a different relationships to how do we become close and intimate. And, and probably one of the answers would be incompatibility, that we are just so different And I'd like to just illustrate how I think that we often look at that. There are some couples that you'd say, this is the husband and this is the wife. And they are so similar. They have similar tastes in food and music and and they have similar uh, occupations. And you'd say, wow, there is so much in common that they have. And we just want you to know that we wish you would shut up. We're not even going to follow your Instagram feed. I mean, it just looks way too easy for a very, very few. Uh, Most of us would say, well, probably this is more like the picture for us. Well, there's a little bit of sliver over there that's, that's common. I mean, this couple, the only difference they have is one's a man and one's a woman. And here you start saying, oh no, we, we are so different. We, we can't agree on politics. Um, one of us is a morning person, the other is a night person. And, and there are so many things that are different. And for some of you, you say, Paul, you don't understand. Uh, I'm not even that close. This is me. And if I were to try to tell you the differences, uh, I love to travel And my wife thinks that the best foreign country to go to would be Hawaii. And I I love to be involved in the arts. And and she hates all that kind of stuff. Or or maybe I'm a vegetarian and my husband is a hunter. And you say, "I, I think they're over there and I'm way over. Actually, that's probably not even far enough. Some of you are thinking, well, you got that way wrong. I am way over here. There are so many differences, it feels like we're not from the same planet. And I think this is an important discussion because it's easy for us to feel like our differences are the problem. And I can show you some compatible couples that can't get along, and I can show you some widely incompatible couples who love each other and who care for each other and who have learned over the years and actually they've pulled together to be more similar. Because the problems are even more than just those surface differences, even though those may not sound like surface differences. Some of the the deeper problems are that our values are so different so that even when we try to say, how do I love my spouse? I want to honor them. I want them to feel special that we don't even have the same language. For example, if, if I were to feel honored, it would be because somebody mentioned something that I had done and maybe they mentioned it in public and they, they gave me a great compliment and man, that, that can fuel my fire for a, for a long time. But that may not make my wife feel honored at all. In fact, uh, the Glazner family is pretty talkative and uh, we have a lot of wide discussions talking over top of each other and, and talking excitedly and it's not it's not conflict, it's fun. And I remember one of the first times I took my wife back to my home of origin and, and we were sitting there at the kitchen table and we were talking and Jan would kind of hesitantly go, um, and boom, somebody just rolled right across her conversation and, and then she'd wait a while and she'd try to put a little something in and, and somebody else would just roll across. So being the loving, engaged 
soon-to-be husband that I was, I said, guys, hold it. Jan wants to say something. <laughs> I only did that once. Uh, she was like a deer in the headlights, and now all of a sudden she couldn't think of anything she wanted to say, and all of these very verbal people are looking at her like, this better be good, you know, we stopped our conversation. And uh, even when I thought I was trying to do something honoring, it was not honoring at all, because even the language we use, and, and one of the things that honors my wife is, don't interrupt her. I, I have such a tendency to, I have so many good ideas, I just want to add to the conversation. And that can be dishonoring. So here's the deal. Differences are not sin. If one of you is messy and one is neat, that's not sin. If one of you is a saver and one of you is a spender, that's not sin. But listen carefully. The chief marriage problem is sin. It's not our differences. It's the way our sin natures respond to those differences. It's the way that we really want everybody to do it our way. In fact, we have this deep desire. And this desire is not only to say, I want a good marriage. The deep desire is, I want selfish control. I want people to be reasonable and to do it my way. And some of you are quiet and you do that in a very, you know, unobtrusive fashion. And some people are just, this is the way I want it done. But I believe this is the essence of the sin problem in all of us is that I really just want control. And what I want to do is I want to re react to the person in front of me instead of respond to God. Or in a marriage situation, I just want my wife to be reasonable and do it my way more than I want to live in a way that's pleasing to God. And let me tell you, this is one of the huge secrets is I have to get my eyes off that other person and I have to begin to say, God, how is it that you want to change me? How can I become more of a man, more of a husband, more of a father that you want me to be? How are my actions doing in relationship to you? So how do we honor God in our marriage? How do we do it in a way that God designed the plan? And I'll tell you, here's the conclusion as we come to the end. Let's go to the end of the passage and see where he's trying to aim. And the Apostle Paul is saying, each one of you also must love his wife, so he's talking to the husbands there, must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. So the two key ideas there are love and respect. They are the lifeblood of every relationship, and especially of marriage. And he said, I want specifically to reinforce that the husband needs to focus particularly on loving his wife, and the wife needs to focus particularly on respecting her husband. And you may wonder why he says that. There's actually a very good book, and it's actually a series on Right Now Media by the Egerich couple, and it's called Love and Respect. And he, they posit that, that men are very sensitive to respect, and women are very sensitive to the need for love. And obviously, all of us need both love and respect. But, but I think it's like the rivets on your jeans, that they put the rivets on your jeans in a place where it's likely to tear out, where it's going to have the most tension. And so I believe God is doing exactly that when he turns, first of all, to the wives and he says, here's an assignment for you. And then he turns to the husband and he says, this is an assignment for you. And if you will both lean into those, then God's design for marriage will work. It will not only make you a better marriage, it will make you a closer to Christ person. In fact, this book that I would just mention, and I'll mention it perhaps later, but it's called Sacred Marriage, and it's by a guy named Gary Thomas, and it's a very powerful book about how do we please God in our marriages, but he's got a great tagline. He says, what if God designed marriage to make us holy more than to make us happy? And again, I, even if you haven't read the book, that question is worth the whole thing. So let's start in on God's assignments for us. So first of all, he turns to the wives and he says, wives, here's your assignment. Here's the first point. I want you to submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. So he said, Wives, here's the place where you're going to have need for a rivet. This is a particular for you. I want you to focus on 
respecting and giving the right of leadership to your husband. And I know that there's all kinds of reactions to that. Honestly, I think it's partly because we see submission as an ugly thing instead of a beautiful thing. And last week I talked to you about how we have a great tendency to hear the Bible through the lens of our culture, that we are often more into Americanism than we are into following Jesus. And I think that what we are talking about here is counter to our culture that our culture says there should be no bosses, or what, you know what really happens? Is it's like, okay, we vow to be married to each other, now fight it out. Who's going to win? Who's going to wear the pants? And I told you last week, anarchy is never God's plan, and that's what that is. Everybody trying to get for themselves from the other. And so he says to wives, I want you to give your husband the gift of leadership. I want you to say, I am going to trust you to lead our family. Now, this is not a silent partnership. This wife is giving her input. She's giving feedback. She is to have open, honest ability to express herself. And I am not talking about abusive situations where husbands are demanding that their wife And they use the word submit, but what they really mean is I want to dominate you. I want to be the king. I want to have all control. And that is not a Christ-honoring picture. And we'll talk about that in just a moment with husbands. But submission, if you remember the definition from last week, this relates to whether it's the government or the church or a family. And he says, and submission means trusting God enough to be humbly responsive to the authorities he's allowed in my life to be humbly responsive, to give that gift of leadership. Human leaders are not perfect, and human husbands are not perfect. But here's what the wife is saying. She's saying, because of my relationship with God, I am going to give you respect. And so, respectful attitudes is the first part of that. And it means that I'm giving you that as a gift. And ladies, wives, let me challenge you for just a moment. We want to be unconditionally loved. We don't want somebody to say, you better do so many things or I won't love you. That's not a picture of Christ-like marriage. And can I just flip the script for a moment? I think we often say love is unconditional, but respect has to be earned. And often there's that, I will disrespect you until you earn my respect. And I believe what God is saying to you wives and to all of us, is that respect is something that we give out of honor to God and that we respect each other. That that a relationship needs unconditional respect as well. And so we are to have respectful attitudes and that follows with responsive action. And that means that this is a, a person who is giving the respect with the tone of voice that they use. This means that I am asking questions in a careful and kind way. And and let me tell you, respectful words are like high octane fuel. If wives knew what honoring their husbands looked like and felt like to a guy, they, they would use that so much more because a guy is so motivated by that idea of being encouraged in those ways. In fact, You know, when Jan says to me, man, that lawn looks nice. I just love the way that looks. It's like, man, I want to go out and mow it again. It's just such a, whatever you honor will have a tendency to be emphasized. In fact, uh, Amy Grishel, who is the wife of Craig Grishel, who is an internationally known pastor and speaker, and she was talking about respecting your husband. And, and the woman she was talking to said, well, that's easy. <laughs> you know, your, your husband's a pastor and, and he's this great guy and he talks about you in such glowing terms. And it's easy to respect him. He's respectable. And Amy just looked at her and said, maybe he's as respectable as he is because I have chosen to respect him. You see, we shape each other. So responsive actions... One more question is, how do you talk about your spouse when they're not in the room? Respect isn't a show that you put on when they're around. It's a deep attitude of the heart that says, no, I, I'm not going to expose his weaknesses. I'm not going to make fun of him just because there's a whole bunch of other people doing that. And then thirdly, I believe that being in submission means that I want to learn how to come alongside of you and make your leadership better. Listen carefully. 
A family is a team. And a great team can even make an average leader excel. Why? Because a team comes along to help make it work. I was talking to one husband and he said, you know, I, I, I can be a leader, but I have such a tendency to pull back because I'm afraid I might fail. I'm afraid it might be wrong. And he said, his wife looked at him one day and she said, honey, go ahead. We'll figure it out. And he said, that was just like so freeing. Like, I don't have to hit the, the perfect shot every time I I'm allowed to have some room for failure. And, and I actually believe it's like the fingers on our hands that our differences either can be places where we hammer at each other and say, why aren't you more like me? Or that we can cover each other's weaknesses and we can say, let me come alongside and, and pick up the pieces that you might miss and fill in the places where you don't see and, and help you see the blind spots that you can't see. So I believe actually the, the motive or the, the motto of people who are under authority, wives and all other places, is I will invest my energy and my wisdom to make your leadership successful. That I'm going to come alongside of you so that we can win. That we're not against each other. We're on the same team. Like sometimes it's good to just look at each other and say, remember, we're on the same team. So wives, I want to just ask you a, a pause this moment question. Do you feel like your husband feels respected? Which is a deeper question than do you ultimately respect him? Do you think the way that you respond on a daily basis makes him feel your respect? And I just want you to wrestle with that. That's a great question to leave you with. And then God turns the dial and he says, okay, talk to wives. Now we're going to talk to husbands. And he says, husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without spot, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless in the same way husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Did you get that? He talked about how Christ laid down his life, and then he says, in the same way. You know, I think sometimes when wives say, well, I have to submit, that's a tough assignment. Let me tell you, these are both tough assignments, because God says to the husband, I don't want you just to love your wife, like bring flowers once in a while and try not to be a jerk. No, I want you to love your wife like Christ loves the church. How did he love the church? He he gave up the glories of heaven to come live in the earth, and then he, he lived as a servant, and then he died the death of the cross. He said, I want you to give yourself, to lay down your life. Because too often we think, whoever gets to be the leader, they get their own way. And this is actually saying the opposite. What does it mean? It means that husbands are to represent Jesus in the way that he loves the church, the way he loves us. And that we're to learn from that and ask ourselves, is that the way I'm loving my wife? Let me just give you a couple of bullet points. He says, it should be spiritual servant leadership. Every one of those words is important. It has to be spiritual. It says that Jesus presented the church to himself as a radiant church because he had poured in his love, because he had washed her with the truth of Scripture. And so our relationship needs to be moving our family towards Jesus, moving our family to be more Christ-like, partly by our own modeling of that. And then it needs to be servant leadership. This is not a benevolent dictator. This is somebody who is willing to do the ugly jobs that nobody wants to do, somebody who is to lead by example, someone who is to lay down my rights and my interests. But it is also leadership. It is not and some of you may have struggled with this because some of you are more aggressive and some of you are maybe more passive. And you know what? God doesn't say, I'm going to choose whoever's the most aggressive, the husband or the wife, to be the leader. No, he says, guys, you're the leader. And here's the deeper question. He says, you're the leader and you're responsible to me for how you lead your family. Now, some of it, that makes us really uncomfortable. And yet he says, I want you to take the story of your family, the spiritual health of your family, the, the way that your wife feels loved, the, the raising of your children, the, the way that they grow up, that's dad, that's your ultimate responsibility. When you stand before God, he's going to say, how did you do with the assignment I gave you? 
And so that, that makes us uncomfortable sometimes. And I will tell you, we, we lead differently because of our personalities. But God doesn't want us to be standing around watching. He wants us to be pouring ourselves. And guys are goal-oriented, but we're often wanting to get that next career move or, or the next boat or the, or the next big bull elk. And he says, I want the top of your priority to be the story that is being created in your family. And then he says, we should be doing that by sensitive listening. And I, I would mention just James chapter one. He says, we are to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Isn't it amazing how really all of scripture is a great marriage manual? We often say, well, that's, that's about something else. Well, it should also be true in our home. That husbands need to be good at listening. And guys, we are mostly lousy at it. So it's a long process of learning how to be a good listener. And then to speak gently. Um, just a little bit back, we talked about in chapter 4 of Ephesians that don't let any words come out of your mouth except for the ones that are going to be building up and edifying and encouraging. And husbands, what if we took that literally to say, I don't want any words to my wife to come out of my mouth that would damage her or hurt her. And, and it's so easy and we are so quick and prone to do that. So God gives assignments. He gives a tough assignment to both of us. And he says, I want you to focus on what your responsibility is. So here's a guy's motto. I will invest my energy and wisdom to lovingly leading our family towards following Jesus more closely. I'm going to make that as a high priority, as one of my main goals. And guys, I want to ask you the same kind of a pondering question. Would your wife say that she feels loved? If I were to have a conversation with her, I don't say, does she know that you love her, that you told her when you got married and you, you uh, haven't said much since. No, I mean, does she feel loved in the way that you listen to her and esteem her and respond to her? Does she feel loved? Because that's such an important question. And I want to give you a, just a chance to think about an example of of a couple, Eric and Marcy, who are part of our church family, and, and we're going to ask them a couple of questions about how being a follower of Jesus has changed how they relate in their marriage. Let's watch this. This is Eric and Marcy Gustafson, and I want to just ask you a couple of questions. Um, Eric, what was your perception of what a husband and father needed to do in the home when you got married? Well, my perception was based on my mom and dad, what I grew up around, and my dad was definitely in charge of the home. You know, he he worked, mom also worked, they both worked, but he was in charge, and, and you gave dad respect because he was dad, and mom gave him respect because he was the husband, and that wasn't Christian-based, you know, um, but, and I don't know why that was necessarily, but that's what I grew up around, you know, so that's what I saw. And so when I started marriage, I kind of thought I was going to fall into that same role of being in charge just because I was the husband, I guess. Okay. And Marcy, what was your perception of what your role was going to be as a wife and a mother? Um, well, in my household, um, my mom was a stay-at-home mom for most of my growing up years, and my dad worked. and. Um, I really didn't have the proper respect probably for what my mom did or appreciation. And so, and I did, I did look up to my dad as far as um, his career and all that he did for our family working. And, and that kind of became my, um, I sort of kind of rebelled against the model that I grew up in instead of following it, um, thinking that I was going to be independent have my own career, take care of myself. And I didn't want to really depend on anyone else for that. Um, so that's kind of how I went into okay. marriage. <laughs> so, so how did this work out in your early years of marriage in terms of harmony in the home? Uh, probably not that well for many years. Um, it didn't work out that well. Uh, and it was, it was a battle. So because I think we both wanted to be in charge, basically. So it was, it, it was a battle, you know, not, it's not like it was a battle all the time, but major decisions were an argument usually. And how did you feel, Marcy? Um, I just felt like I didn't want to be, I wanted to do my thing and, um, you know, not be, 
I didn't want to lose myself, I guess, in, uh, to somebody else. I wanted to, um, pursue my own goals and dreams and, you know, not comply with what somebody else had in mind for me to do. And so if you had read the Bible verse about submitting to your husband, what would you have thought about that? Yeah, I wouldn't have agreed with that at all. <laughs> and I was thinking to, you know, about what submitting is. And I think my old self, I would have, uh, I would have thought that submit equals lose. And, and I, I wouldn't have wanted that. Okay, so now you've, many years later, you've come to Christ, and he's now the center of your home in both of your lives, and you've had a lot of years to work out of this. Um, Marcy, what would you see some of the changes that you've seen in your husband? Um, I, think he's, uh, I think he's a much better listener than he used to be. Um, he, he'll hear my opinion, and um, it doesn't mean we do everything that I want to do, but he hears my opinion, and I don't have to. Um, it doesn't have to be a conflict for me to be heard. And, and I think he's also, it's easier for me to follow him now because I know he's, he's following Jesus. And so that makes it much easier for me to follow him because I know he's, he's trying to do what God wants him to do. And that is just a huge relief to me. And it helps me to trust him. Um, but he's, he's gentler and he listens better and I just, uh, yeah, it's just easier to fall into that role and, and let him be the leader. So. Okay. Eric, what have you seen change in Marcy over this time? Well, um, I've seen that she definitely is, has submitted to me and, and, but it's, you know, Christ calls for me to love her at the same time, you know? So I had to be careful to not overstep the bounds. I, I don't want to be king in the household, you know? So we work as a unit, basically, as a single unit is the way we see it. But yet she's, ultimately, she, you know, if she feels I'm following the Lord, she's following what what um, what I think we should be doing. And, and most of the time we both feel the same way, but, but it just, it's a lot different household to live in when you both have that mutual respect and she, uh, she um, is so much different than she used to be when she was a career oriented and she was, uh, was an engineer and that's what she was doing and she wasn't staying at home with kids or doing anything like that. Now her focus is kids and the family, you know, so. Mm-hmm. What a, what a powerful story. And actually, when I was talking to them later, Marcy said, the one thing I wish I'd mentioned is I wish I'd mentioned how important it is to pray for your spouse. And boy, I would echo that is really an important thing because not only does God change your spouse, God begins to change you as you pray for people. And I want to share with you a picture that I think illustrates in a very practical way some of these deep, I mean, we talk about these high spiritual concepts of loving and honoring and respecting, and, and I want to bring it down to some very practical, how does that really work in everyday life? And so this is an illustration that's called the love bank, and what it's saying is very simply is that we have a love bank, and every time that you are responding, and you, and you have a, a bank account for everybody in your life, but particularly husbands and wives, every time that you respond with a compliment or a positive thing or thank you or I appreciate you, that is a deposit. And every time you make some kind of a criticism, every time you fail to follow through with what you said you were going to do, and specifically every time you cuttingly make a harsh comment or, or have a big, big blow up, then there are withdrawals. And if you, no matter how high your account was to start with, if you are having more withdrawals than deposits, you're going in debt. This is basic economics, but you would destroy your relationships the same way you destroy your credit score. And what happens is there are service charges. And we talked about right how difficult marriage is. And right now, there is lots of downward pressure. Not only do we have the normal service charges and the normal just being humans, 
But all of this COVID crisis has created so much tension. And so there is so much being taken out of our bank accounts. And so I want to take this very basic financial principle and say, how does that apply to how you respond to each other in your marriage? And I think marriage is easier to get into than it is to stay in. Uh, it's easy to be in love when you start because you're, you're being kind to each other, you're being careful, you're getting to know each other, it's all exciting and new, and people often start with a very high balance. But here's the ultimate truth. If you are trying to get your life from your partner, ultimately that will fail because two fallible human beings cannot fill each other up. If he, he completes me is your way of going about this, you're going to ultimately fail. So what is the spiritual side of this? What does it mean that when we have Christ in the middle of us? What does it mean is that you and I both need to go to God and say, okay, God, I can't love my wife like Christ loved the church. That's impossible. And it says that when we're filled with the Spirit, then we have the fruits of the Spirit. And when God fills me up and my fulfillment in my life comes from Him, then I can make deposits in my wife's account Not because I feel like she deserves it or we're doing, I'm doing one and you're doing one and we're keeping score, but because God has given me so much love that I'm going to pour into you no matter what you do. And if the wife is saying, I need to go to God because (laughs) trusting God to work through this husband of mine, man, that is a big step of faith. And I'm going to go to God for that faith and to trust him and to have him fill me up. And he's the one that gives me love. And then I can choose to make deposits in my partner's account. And let me tell you, the better you know your partner, the better you will be able to make deposits that really matter. You'll know what really honors them, what makes them feel loved and respected. And in the middle of all this withdrawal from COVID crisis, there is also just the fact that we are sinful people that the the main problem in your marriage is that your partner married a sinful person. And so we have to come back and say, oh man, what we need is the grace of God over all of this. We need to understand that we've been forgiven and because of God's great forgiveness that I need to forgive my spouse. I need to understand their frailties because what happens is if you keep going into withdrawal and you keep going down and down and down and down and down, What happens is this whole idea that you used to be such in love and it was always so wonderful and you could talk about anything. All of a sudden you get to this place down here and you don't feel in love anymore. In fact, you think, why did I ever marry them? And and you say, I can't, we can't talk about anything. Everything is like a unexploded landmine. And the good news that I want to give you is that if you can get filled up with God, if you can get your assignment from God, and then you can say, by God's grace, I am going to do for my partner what they need instead of trying to get what I need. The good news is that God can can bring out of this mess and he can begin to bring you to the place where you have joy in your relationship again, where there is that sense of being completed by each other, of caring for each other, not because your partner is the source of life, but because God has put you together and together this is the home that's to express the love of Jesus to the world. And so good news is I've seen seen families that were way down here, gone through an affair, dealing with addictions, awful, ugly stuff. They are so far in debt, you think they'll never get out. And God begins to restore them. And the other valuable part about this picture is it says one great weekend is not going to fix everything. It's how do we do daily at loving and respecting because God is pouring into me and I choose to pour into my spouse. We want you to wrestle with these things because these are critically important to not only the joy and the hope within your own family, but your kids are watching. They're getting marriage training. The singles around you are watching. In fact, we have some people that were on staff. They say, I grew up in a home that was a mess. I didn't know how to live like Christ wants us to. And I watched some other couples who were doing it well. And that's where we learned. I want to pray for us. I want to ask that God would speak to each one of us individually about what we're supposed to walk out of this. And then we have a discussion question for you. Let me pray. God, I come as one who needs your help because love and respect sound really easy, but 
Really, it's a lot of soul-searching hard work. And God, I ask for each one of us that you would give us a new commitment to get our life from you, to get our love from you, and then to give to our spouses and to give to our children and to give to others. And I pray, God, that we would be willing to humbly come to an assignment that we can't possibly do and ask that you would do it in us and through us and that our homes, family church would be full of families where people look at them and they say, I see Jesus there. I see love there. I see respect there for 50 and 60 and 70 years. And that God, you would make a difference in us so that we can make a difference in the world. And we ask that you would do that in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're married, I want you to simply ask for yourself, not for your spouse, what is God saying about my attitude and the role he's called me to? God's called me to this. How do I feel about that? Talk about it in a practical and honest way. And if you are single, whether you are young and learning about marriage or whether maybe you've been through some other hard things about marriage, then you say, where does that selfish control show up in my life? Because it's not just married couples. This is all of us. And so I want you to humbly talk about that and and maybe even talk about how does this picture of marriage help you as you focus on the future? So spend a few moments and I want the guys, so the oldest guy in the room, I want you to start discussion. Thanks for joining us.